And welcome Flip Clock fans. We've got something a little different here. Might be considered a train wreck. This clock has been damaged pretty severely. We don't know the extent of it. And this is a very unique clock. You may have seen this before. This is rare. This is one of the first Copal 101s. This Japanese here talks about how to change it from 50 hertz to 60 hertz operation. As you may know, Japan has both 50 and 60 hertz. We're looking at the clock, and it becomes apparent pretty quickly that the clock has probably been dropped. We've got some tile issue here. It's a wonder that's even moving. Major issues there inside. We don't really know what we've got in here until we get in here. But major case damage, and it's a wonder that someone actually kept this clock after that happened. I'm very appreciative of it because this is a unique clock and you may notice there's a plug-in that's unusual for these clocks and a and a switch we've got to find out what the switch is for lots of tiles and pieces but the glass is intact I'm looking over trying to get a grasp of what might have happened the mechanism here looks to be in good shape and if you keep your eyes open, if you've had any experience with clocks, you'll notice that is not a, a typical copal mechanism. The clock itself came directly from Japan. And this clock was Japan's first digital flip clock. It was designed by Riki Watanabe in 1964. It really could be said to be the flip clock that got things started because the copal motors, especially the copal 2, went on to show up in most every flip clock every flip clock that's still running today, that is. These are excellent motors. The Japanese perfected the flip clock technology. So I've taken off the two screws here that hold the mechanism in place. And we've got more tiles falling out. So there's your mechanism. And another piece. A unique look here. It's got the clockworks. It just looks cool. And here's the motor base plate. You can see it's set for 50 hertz. So you see here there's two wheels that a, a worm gear contacts. And one of the, it'll contact the upper gear for 50 hertz and the lower gear for 60 hertz operation. A good chunk of numbers missing and they all seem to be from the same area. So that's consistent with a drop because it's gonna be like a, a force that comes through that clock. It bursts through, probably pounded out all those tiles. We're just hoping that the, that the tabs are well, there you go. We're just hoping that the tabs are still intact. That it was just a that sudden force that blew them all out. And it looks to be the case here. So far, so good. I don't see any major damage to the mechanism. It's pretty surprising. We'll probably start by getting these tiles back in before we go any further with trying to restore the case. It's like putting a puzzle together. Again, the case, the restoration of the case, getting it fixed. We'll have to decide on that. You're going to have to think about what you might do. Uh, what I end up doing, you may not agree with. But I've got something in mind here to try to preserve the clock. Maybe not to make it perfect. There's that glass. Uh, these Copal Caslons, they had glass in there in the past, the first ones which is wonderful when the, when the glass is still intact. So they, they clean up very nicely. So we'll go ahead and start putting in the tiles. The way you do that is you, you place one tab in a hole and, and I'm going to go ahead and kind of bend it in the center and drop it in. Now I've done this before so I'll make it look easy. Now you don't know with any flip clock tile if it's gonna be able to take that if it's gotten brittle over time or if it's gonna accept that bend, because I'm bending it, and I'm trying not to bend the tabs. You see, I'm flexing the top itself. 
it's going in great. So we'll go ahead and finish that up. I actually don't even know yet if I've got all the tiles. I would presume I do. And one could have got out that big old crack. But I won't know until I get to the end if I've got all the tiles. And our last tile. Completes it. Let's see how we're let's see how we're flipping here. This is looking great. We don't know if the clock even runs yet. We'll have to check that out. I had to kind of figure out what voltage this used because it doesn't say. Japan uses 100 volts, so that's what I'm going to power this up with later. So getting back to the, to the case here. There's several things you can do when you have messed up plastic. I've done, done my research on YouTube and Google like you would expect. And there's a lot of different kinds of techniques. But we have to see that applies to flip clocks, and especially this one in particular. That front piece is good. It's got a recessed copal letters there. That's neat. And the glass, there's no chips. It's dirty. You can tell this clock was probably never really opened after it had its catastrophe. No one tried to clean it. I'm looking to see if it actually seals back up. I don't think anything's warped. It does. So how to close that off? And that's the question. There's, there's various cracks here. That's the question we've got to decide. How to close this off and how perfect do you expect to get the clock? And what are the trade-offs if you go for perfection? That's the question. See, there's a couple pieces missing there. And that crack's pretty evident there. So after doing a lot of my, my homework here, some people have taken to correct plastic with, with a soldering iron or a heat gun. And I actually practiced that on another piece of plastic, but what I found out about this plastic, which is ABS plastic, uh, Cyclac in particular, is that this stuff takes a lot of heat to melt, a lot more than your cheap old plastics. The Cyclac that they used is good stuff. So, I get that, and then I, you know what I decided? You risk warping that plastic, so I'm not gonna use heat. So another thing is acetone. Acetone will melt plastic. I've told you about that before. Acetone's bad stuff. Now that stuff is thin, and when I practiced with it on another piece of plastic, it went inside that crack and wicked right up to the other side. Now the people who are using this, a lot of car buffs and motorcycle guys, they're gonna sand that on the outside and repaint it. And you think, well, you could sand it and you could polish it. I'm going to tell you later why I'm not going to do that. And there's a, there's a good reason. So I'm going to go back to my, to my old standby, which is a good standby, which is a good work for this type of stuff. And that's going to be super glue. But in this case, not only super glue, but super glue and baking soda, which makes a firmer bond and actually uh, will, will cure quickly. The super glue could wick, but if I put it just on the inside of the crack, it won't, and it didn't. So here we are, I've completed the process. So I put it on the inside of the crack, closed it so it didn't wick out, but then I immediately put that, sprinkled lightly that baking soda on there. That caused it to cure immediately to stop it from trying to, to work its way to the outside. And there none did work its way out. That plastic, that's just rough plastic from the break. Now we have to see if it's going to go back together. Did it Did it get warped in the drop? Did, and you can see pretty quickly that no, it did not. It's amazing that it held together. You know, I dropped a RC6015, a Back to the Future clock once, and it shattered like it was glass. I dropped it from about six feet. We don't want to go into that too much. It was painful. It destroyed it. Now you look here. I want you to see something. This is a couple one-on-one. A Copal one-on-one that has a kind of a nice shiny finish. That's kind of the standard on this. But look over here. There's no shiny on it at all. In fact, it's got more of a matte kind of look to it. I don't know how they did that. So I could sand that out and I could polish that. 
but I'm gonna get away from the actual look that I think they were going for in this clock, which is a matte finish. So I'm gonna let it go for now. We'll go back to that, like, you know, someday if someone else wanted to follow up my restoration, they could, because I didn't mess it up to any point where they couldn't undo what I did. But for now, I'm gonna leave it. This thing here didn't require any touch up at all. I didn't even have to clean it. It was, it was clean. The glass cleaned up very nicely, as you would expect. No scratches. Clear as a bell. So it's going to look good when we get this all together. It's a little closer look at our mechanism. We've got it set for the 60 hertz. I do have this voltage down to 100 volts because that's Japanese voltage. My household runs at about 122 volts and I don't want to overpower that motor. I don't want to take any chances. There's that worm gear in action. Onto the lower gear now of that stacked gear set. That's for the 60 hertz operation. It's really cool to watch this work. I'd almost like to just leave it out in the open so I could watch it. Everything's functioning fantastic. Everything's going well. The light is working fine and it, it is controlled by that switch. You can see this bulb looks new. And I believe it's probably because the owner had that turned off for most of the time, if not all the time. It does, it looks almost unused. And there's our switch. It is a switch that is rated for 125 volts. Now when I first started this motor, it sounded like a train coming off the tracks. And it needed oil. And the cool thing about these Copal 1s, which is what I call them, is that you can oil it from the backside, right over there by the, those two wheels. You can't do that with a Copal 2s. Now here's our transformer. It's a Japanese transformer that the Japanese would use if they came to the United States to power like their computers and stuff because you don't want to overpower a computer or sensitive electronics like that. So this is actually geared towards Japanese. The packaging is for Japanese. Now this cord, it's for a 220 volt flip clock that I have because this clock did not come with a cord, but that's the kind of cord that it needs. We've got it all together and it's looking fine. We're just going to check the light. It's working, working adequately. And check the flipping. Now I want you to notice something. Count the number of times the hours flip. So there's one, two, three, four, five hour cards for every hour. Now look at the standard. There's one. Two. So there's only two. They've redone how they used to do this. So this is a sign of an old clock. And so you know you've got one of the older ones because it has five hour cards. It's one of the ways. You know the other ways. Different mechanism. So you see what I've got. You can still see the cracks. On the desk you're not going to notice it. I'm happy with it. I'm sorry if you're not. But I hope you agree with me. Someone else can come back later and do a, a different re restoration. I haven't messed that up for them, and I've got the clock working again. It looks great, and it runs great. It's, com it's completely silent. The oiling really took care of business. So there it is, my set of Copal 101s. Thanks for taking the time. Hello, Flip Clock fans. My name is Miki Hiramoto, and here is what this label says. 60 cycle no torizukeichi. Mountaining partition for 60 cycle seconds. 50 cycle no torizuke ichi. Mountaining partition for 50 cycle seconds. Dengen shuhasu ni yoru kirikae nitsuite. Switching by power source frequency. 50 cycle kara 60 cycle no kirikae wa case sokumen no sanke no neji o tori, kikai o tori dashite, sazu no yoru ni mota uke ita o shuhasu ni awasete torizuke te kudasai. For switching between 50 cycle second and 60 cycle second, please set the monitor strike plate as indicated on the diagram at left by taking out the three screws on the base of the case. Then the machine 